It is Friday, April 19th, 2024. This is another edition of Baseball Today. That is my very good friend, Stephen Brault, filling in for the dude, Trevor Plouffe. I am Chris Rose, producer Dan, along for the ride as well. How you been, my man? I've been doing really well. Just getting used to my my new job. Uh, you know, working pregame, postgame for the Pittsburgh Pirates. Having a blast. And uh, I love talking about baseball. So it's like now I just get to do it as a job. And so anytime that I can hop in and try to live up to the excellence that is Trevor Plouffe, I will do my best. So I'm happy to be here. It's great to see you. Um, and I love that hat. That's their mm. batting practice hat this year. And it is sick. It is. Did you did you steal one from the clubhouse? I haven't yet, but I'm going to. I'm yeah. definitely going to. I've been like I've been trying to make sure that I don't, you know, overstep my boundaries here too soon as I because you know I'm not a player anymore I understand how it was when guys would come in like there's a little bit of a you want to make sure that you're not think like I don't want people to think that I think that I am like on the team you know what I mean so I'm I'm taking my time with it but it is great to be back in Pittsburgh uh everything about it is awesome I love this place so yeah it's good I'm gonna get one of those hats though I will yeah you need one and then the next time we have you on, we can have dueling Pittsburgh star hats from their 1979 We Are Family. Yeah, 16 stars. We'll take that. I, dude, I, that was always something when we played, when I was playing, I was like, man, imagine being able to do the Stargill Stars thing, like actually do it. You know, it's so at this point now, it's like college football is the only right. people that really do that. So it, it doesn't really have the same vibe to it, but it was really cool when they did it back then. Um, so it's just a very Pirates thing from a very important time in Pirates history. So I love it. Well, uh, I, I'm i wearing this hat twofold. Obviously, one, because you are on the show. But number two is because our fourth topic of the day, Paul Skeens, which is going to be a fascinating discussion in terms of where we take this today. So make sure you hold tight. Uh, before we do get to our five topics, tip of the cap, the New York Mets City Connect jerseys came out. I got to be honest with you. I like on a scale of zero to 10, I would rate them pretty high. Like I'm thinking eight, eight and a half, dude. Yeah. I'm, I'm a big fan of these. I saw them when they, when they first came out and I, okay. So here's, here's a problem that I have. I, I honestly thought the Phillies ones are, are really bad. And I, I have a problem with it because it's so not Philly to me. That's kind mm -hmm. of the idea. Um, I love these. I've always thought the Mets have had cool uniforms. And I think a lot of people would agree their black tops are probably their best uniforms. And so I love that they kind of leaned into that with these uniforms, go with the black, the dark pinstripes, the dark charcoal gray. It's unique. It's cool. It's different, but also it's, it's very New York to me. So yeah. I'm a huge fan. Yeah. And also there's a lot of in, uh, intricate details hat yeah. all over the uniform between the colors they mix in some subway. They mix in some concrete jungle. The Queensboro Bridge is on the uh, cap as well. You can read about it. Go find the. There's a little like 90 second Twitter video I think MLB put out explaining all the details. So it's really really good. Um, let's get to it. Battle of underpaid Scott Boris lefties tonight <laughs> out by the bay, or, or in the case of Jordan Montgomery, reportedly former Scott Boris clients. Right. Um, Montgomery's going to make his first start for the Arizona Diamondbacks. Blake Snell will make his third for the Giants. It's been a little bit of a struggle so far. My question to you is, which pitcher is going to set himself up better this year for another shot at free agency? Of course, they could both opt out after this year. Look, I, I – okay, so I've thought about this a lot. This offseason, I, I thought about it a lot because I was thinking if I'm a GM, right, we all like to play GM, which one of these players would I want to pay a lot of money – over a long period of time to be on my team, right? And so if I'm doing that, if I'm the GM, when it comes down to it, I want consistency over extreme domination for short periods of time. So I'm just gonna start there and I'm gonna say, I'm gonna start at the end, which is I think Montgomery is the much safer bet for somebody to sign to a long-term deal. I don't necessarily know if Snell's ever gonna get a long-term deal at this point. He's gonna turn 32 next year. I think he'll be looking at, if he's looking at a long-term deal, I think for Snell, realistically, it'll be four years. I don't think anybody is going to give him more than that because you've seen, we've seen two incredible Cy Young years from Blake Snell, right? I mean, two incredible years where he was clearly the best pitcher in his league, but through in between those years, he's not the same guy. 
He's never thrown even remotely close to 180 innings, which is his max in both of his Cy Young years. Both were at 180 innings. And his other years, his highest is like 128 or something like that. Other than that, you're getting a guy who walks a lot of people, strikes out a lot of people, but just does not go deep in games. Weird for me, last year, Blake Snell only had three games where he threw seven innings. Three. I don't know if I've ever heard of a Cy Young winner doing that. Just for reference, Garrett Cole had 11. And that was, you know, he had sevens and eights and complete games. Or Blake Snell is three, seven inning games, and that was it. And to me, that's not like an ace that I want to pay a long-term deal to. I'm interested to see what will happen with him if he does, again, what he did last year, which is kind of start slow Mm -hmm. and then like, figure it out and become the best pitcher in baseball, which is totally possible. But if he does that, does that mean that somebody's going to all of a sudden be willing to give him, you know, a seven year deal? I don't know. I, I don't think I would. Well, I, I got to tell you, dude. Um, well, first of all, you nailed this. I don't know if it's because you, your eyes went, Ooh, we're talking about <laughs> left-handed pitchers. And so, yeah. I mean, um, but to me, the one I couldn't figure out was Jordan Montgomery. Like what? Same. Is- what is it that people are looking for in free agency? Uh, if you're not looking for the splash guy in Snell, I want a dude who's going to make 30 starts. Check that box. That's all Montgomery has done since he became a big league starter on a full-time basis. Uh, I'm looking for a guy who's always improving. That's exactly what's happened. And I'm looking for a guy who can get it done in the postseason. I think he showed that to us last year. And it's yeah. any sort of environment. He got traded at the deadline in consecutive years. And as you well know, it's not easy for guys to immerse themselves. Like their life gets sh- gets turned upside down. For us, it's easy. Like one day he's wearing one uniform, and the next day on our TV or whatever screen we're watching <laughs> the game on, he's just in a different one. We're like, ah, it's still baseball. Their shit gets turned upside down, and he has handled that seamlessly, going from New York to St. Louis, and then St. Louis to Arlington. Yeah, so- I mean, I I thought the same thing because if you look at his last three years, right? He goes 30, 30 starts with like 158 innings and a 3.8 ERA in 21. 22, it's 32 starts, 180 innings with a 3.5 ERA. And last year, it's 32 starts with 188 innings and a 3.2 ERA. So like you said, not only showing consistency, but consistently getting just a little bit better every year. And like for me as a GM, that seems like the guy I want to give a long-term deal to. I wish I could have been a fly on the wall in Scott Boris's office to hear the offers that he did get at the beginning of free agency. Cause I really find it hard to believe that a 31 year old pitcher, this is, he's going to be 31 all season. Actually they're both December 92 babies, right. which is funny. But if you have a guy like Montgomery that you can sign for five years, like I, I have a hard time believing that nobody threw five years at him. Like uh, that would blow my mind. And I think that they were just so set on seven that, that they just never came down. And it makes you wonder uh, because he has changed reportedly changed representation from Boris to Wasserman and Joe Wolf, you know, Mm. if there were deals on the table and Boris said, no, we can do better. We will probably never know, but it is fascinating to think about. All right, let's move on to a guy uh, who is somewhat established himself. Justin Verlander is making his 2024 major league baseball debut Astros in Washington for a rematch of the 2019 World Series. Uh, Later this summer, we do expect Clayton Kershaw to resume his career with the Los Angeles Dodgers. Of course, he is coming off of arm surgery. Uh, You can only take one of those two careers, Verlander, Kershaw. Which one and why? So I honestly thought that this was going to be an easy decision for me when I first got this question posed to me. And then I did research and then it became a lot harder, actually. Um, but dude, when it comes down to it, I'm taking Kershaw. One, he's left-handed, which I just think is super cool. Like maybe that is a little selfish of me, but it's just how I am. Um, I love that he played for one team his whole career. You know, Justin Verlander basically had an entire career with the Tigers before he moved to the Astros. But I mean, he's got 13 years of over 30 starts. Like that's an insane amount of starts that Justin Verlander has had. But for me, Kershaw, you know, when you think about Kershaw, what is the first thing you think about? Two things, bad in the playoffs and was hurt a lot. But if you go look at his stats, he still, he's never had a season. This will be his first season where he's not going to get 20 starts. 
that's pretty incredible to think about. But also the numbers that he's put up, just the left-handed absolute dominance. We're talking about Verlander, who's one of the best pitchers of this era, versus Kershaw, who's one of the best pitchers of all time. And that's kind of the comparison that I'm looking at. Um, Kershaw's got like the lowest whip out of any live ball era pitcher. He had, what, like five seasons ready to whip under one. He's just silly amount of dominant throughout his career. Um, and for me, that's more of what I'm going. I, I wish he had more World Series wins. He's only got the one in 2020. But like, I mean, if you win one, then, you know, it still counts. You won a World Series. But I'm taking Kershaw. I, did, I don't know what you would think, but I'm taking Kershaw. It's a tough one. I know. This is really tough because I did. I pulled up the side by side numbers on yeah. everything. And I actually forgot. I was like, God, did Kershaw get to 3,000 strikeouts last year or not? He's 56 shy. So close. Yeah, he's, he's so close. I wonder if, if that's part of the reason he came back or not. I mean, he's accomplished so much. He's made goo gobs of money. He's got four kids now. He lives in Texas in the offseason. I'm just curious how much. And, and by the way, I wouldn't begrudge him. Like, I think that's <laughs> right. There's only certain number of it's a small number i forget what exactly the number is 20 some or whatever that have 3000 strikeouts and they're all right. all fame except for the guys who have asterisks by their name mm -hmm. yeah so dude i don't know how you don't take kershaw though like i i for me a big part of it is being in one team the whole time and i think that's why like kershaw probably could have gone other places he, like we say he could go to texas and finish out his career there for me like if i'm kershaw I want to be known as the guy who was with the Dodgers until he retired. So I think uh, personally, I don't know him, but it, it seems to me like he'd rather stay in, in LA or retire than go play somewhere else. Um, and I totally, absolutely understand that, especially now that he has his first, you know, real injury that he has to deal with. But I mean, 10 time all-star, like he's just, he's had the career that every pitcher would want. You know what I mean? And also just, he's so amazing. <laughs> like he just never, nobody ever got on base ever his whole career against them. It's insane. Yeah. The, um, when you say who is the pitcher of the era in which you grew up and let's say you're 25 years old, it's Clayton Kershaw. I mean, that is the be. answer that that's the answer. Um, and Verlander, Verlander's probably a I think it's probably a distant second to be honest with you which is yeah. kind of strange because is I mean the numbers are you can, if you like strikeouts Verlander's got that but if you like strikeout percentage Kershaw's got that they're so close in in so many of those numbers now let me speaking of numbers let me throw this out at you this is an old Dan Patrick trick since we now have a new partnership with with DP all right how much money has Clayton Kershaw earned in his career well, let's see. He signed a three hundred million at some point, somewhere near that. Um, I'm gonna guess he's around five hundred. No, four nine. That's it. Did you just say that's it? Eighty nine <laughs> million. You just said that's it. But imagine if Clayton Kershaw was playing, if it was making his debut right now and had the exact same career. That guy would be making absolute insane amounts of money in the market of today which is if you can find a starting pitcher that is better than everybody else and actually does stay healthy or at least you assume he's going to because you can never know that for sure but if you could know that going into kershaw he would he would have made so much more money i'm surprised he doesn't have more okay how much did justin verlander make and he's still making yeah he has to have made more i would say over 300 somewhere give me a guess all right, 335. 404. With another 35 on the table next year if he pitches 140 innings. Oh, okay, so I'm still taking Kershaw's career because I really don't think the difference between <laughs> 250 million and 440 million is that crazy. But um, but yeah, dude, like that, see, that is that's funny to me. That's just like that's a that's an era difference I, I don't know why verlander made so much more he has played for 18 seasons so that's i mean that's gonna help but the i mean kershaw maybe took a little bit of a discount stay in la i don't know i mean but verlander think of it he's 41 years old and he had signed a two-year deal worth 86 million with the mets yeah that's why. i mean just okay 
That's Steven, fair. You were this close. You were this close to uh, 299 or 404 million. That can, I know, right? Can, that close. Can you imagine uh, if you're like, you know, if you're Kershaw and you get to play until you're 35 and make 250 million or you're Verlander and you have to play until you're 42 or 43 to make 440 million. I think there's a lot of guys that would be okay with taking the 35 and 250 million because that extra seven years is a long time. Dude must dig it. And yeah, hopefully he comes back and is still great because I love watching him pitch. And it, at 41 years old, if he's real quickly in 30 seconds, is he still going to be great? Yeah, I think so. I don't see there's any reason why he wouldn't be. He's come back from injury before. It doesn't, I really don't think it's going to matter. Like he's, he's Justin Verlander, man. He's got gross stuff. He's got good commands and he throws hard. So yeah, he's going to be good. Yeah. All right. Baseball fans. Are you like me? You hate foul balls. I mean, you know, the kind, no matter how much you scrub them in the shower, they still stank. Well, ditch the soap, step up to the plate with Mando whole body deodorant. It is developed by a doctor. It's got a game changing formula that is safe for your entire body and knocks out odor like a champ. Now, Mando is made with mandelic acid, which picks off odor right at the source, and it keeps you fresh for up to 72 hours. That doesn't mean you should go without showering for three days, but if you have to and you're in a case of emergency, Mando is going to take care of you. It's available in solid sticks, invisible cream, body wash, cleaning bars, deodorant wipes for on-the-go use as well. Listen, we've all been there. We've all had a tough weekend and it's starting to get a little steamy out where maybe you couldn't clean up exactly the way. And now you got to go to like something that your significant other booked and you're like, oh my God, do we have to go there? Right. We can't, don't, can't, can't I run, go chat. Yo, you don't have time to do that. So Mando's going to help you clean up on the run. And it is seriously safe to use anywhere on your body, in the pits, package, belly button, cracks. Sticky crevices, stomach folds. Some of us have those. Some of us have multiple of those. And feet as well. It's clinically proven to control odor better than a shower with soap. The Mando Starter Pack is perfect for brand new customers. It comes with a solid stick deodorant, cream tube deodorant, two free pot products of your choice like mini body wash and deodorant wipes, and free shipping as well. And luckily, we have a discount code for you to help you get hooked on my favorite smelling whole body deodorant on the market. New customers, you're going to get five bucks off a starter pack with our exclusive code. That equates to over 40% off your starter pack. Use that code baseball today at shopmando.com. That is S H O P M A N D O.com. The D O will get rid of the B O. We continue on. Fun one in your original stomping grounds of Baltimore. People forget you were original Orioles draft pick. Yeah, yeah. 2013, 11th round, baby. Let's go. That away. And then you were traded for Travis Snyder, I believe. I was. I was a player to be named later. Have proud PTBNL over here. That away. That away. Yeah. Do you guys have like some sort of alumni club? No, I think I should start it though. I gotta I there's gotta be some good ones in there. I know there are. I because I remember when I got traded, somebody told me like, you know, oh, did you know that this guy was a PTBNL? Blah blah blah. That was a long time ago though, and I, I don't remember. My favorite one, I believe, was Michael Brantley that we got him in the CC Sabathia trade. I think he was. <sighs> that's a good, good one. Yeah, that's a good one. Anyway, speaking of good, Baltimore taking on Kansas City this weekend. That should be a lot of fun. Are you more interested in seeing if Baltimore can repeat last season's dominance or if the Royals can contend the entire season in the AL Central? Apples to oranges. This is this is my answer to this question because I think that as a as a real true baseball fan, which I consider myself to be, uh, both are equally as interesting and exciting because both of these organizations have done everything they can to get to this point to make it so that they are competitive. With the Royals, they are trying to be competitive. With the Orioles, they are going for the World Series win this year, and there's no reason that they shouldn't have a strong possibility of doing that. They did everything right. They develop position players better than anybody in baseball. Um, they have amazing uh, – their, their lineup all the way through is great. Their worst players right now are Adley Rutschman and Anthony Santander. They're, they're going to figure it out. Uh, they brought up Jackson Holiday early because – they can because they don't need him to go hit 400 right now to make this team win. They just 
want him to get the experience of being around a winning team, which is what the Orioles are. They went and got Kimbrell. They went and got Corbin Burns in the offseason to shore up their rotation and their bullpen. Um, I mean, I absolutely love where the Orioles are at. I think it would be insane not to. Uh, and so I'm extremely interested in watching that. But because I think they should win, I, I really do think that they are not only – they're an AL East favorite for me, but also they're an AL favorite for me and a World Series like right up there. But the Dodgers and Braves are just so good, so it's like I wouldn't say they're necessarily the favorite. But the difference is that the Dodgers and the Dodgers are a team that's going to be good because they went and bought all these guys, of course, which I have no problem with. And the Braves are the guys who went and signed up all these contracts, right? The early contracts. The Orioles are just doing this through sheer development. Not a lot of these guys are still on rookie contracts or in arbitration. They have a window that's 10 years long if they want to keep this team together, um, if they're willing to eventually spend that money. Not only that, they got Kerstad and Stowers and Kobe Mayo and Connor Norby all in AAA who just would be on a lot of other big league teams, not on this team. Dude, they're stacked. They're stacked, and I love watching them play. Pirates took two out of three of them in a very strange series uh, in Pittsburgh a little bit ago. But – and then I'll go to the Royals. The Royals are interesting because – they did what they were supposed to do, which is they found their star player and they signed him. They locked him up. You're going to be here and we're going to build around you. Most of the time you see teams do this, that means good things. The one <laughs> exception I can think of is Mike Trout, which is just a huge bummer where for him personally that the organization can't build around him in the way that the Royals, it looks like, are going to be able to do. They've got some other young talent, which is great. The difference between the Royals and the Orioles, I like the Royals pitching staff actually a lot better. Uh, a lot They've got a lot of young guys, Brady Singer, Cole Reagans. I mean, those guys are going to be absolutely tremendous, I think. And, you know, when you got some guys, you know, Salvador Perez is just all of a sudden just hitting bomb after bomb after bomb in the last few years. I really like the Royals. I find them very interesting. Signing Lugo and Waka to kind of fill out that rotation was huge. Um I think that they could go for some bullpen help, but you know, right now they went and got Will Smith and Chris Stratton and, and they've actually been the worst uh, players in the bullpen for them so far this year. They'll figure it out. And I mean, I love them. I love watching them. If you haven't been watching Royals games, uh, I suggest strongly that you do because it's a very exciting team to watch. Yeah. It's been brutal the last couple of years because yeah. of that pitching, because the pitching's been so good, and I still, I believe they still lead the league in fewest runs allowed. I haven't checked in the last 48 hours, but um, they've been very good. To me, the Orioles are a fascinating case study because of their pitching situation, right? They went out and made the play for Corbin Burns uh, on the last year of his contract, and that is the dude who you can plug in game one of the playoffs and say, go ahead, you match him. Like, it's not us trying to match you finally. It's like, you go, you find somebody as good <laughs> as that dude. Now, the rest of the rotation is interesting. It could end up being where, come July, they feel perfectly fine with the guys they've got there. Grayson Rodriguez, Dean Kramer, right? They've, Cole Irvin's back pitching now. Tyler Wells, yeah. Yeah, but he's a little banged up now, so we, yeah. and we don't know exactly how long he's going to be out. Right. So, to me, that's the interesting part, and they have got so many young players that everybody else craves. So, do they go pull the trigger – on a guy that they could put right behind Burns and feel great about him. Is that – go ahead. Okay, yeah, here's a question for you. The teams that signed Snell and Montgomery, mm -hmm. the Diamondbacks and the Giants, okay, they both signed to one-year deals that they can, you know, figure out whatever, second-year right. opt-out stuff. But I can – it's very small chance that both those teams are going to be right there in the playoffs. Right. Um, it could I, be either or with those two. Like exactly. one and then the other one bites it. And I could see either of those teams tr deciding, okay, we have enough, they have enough of a base and we're not going to have this guy next year anyway. So let's trade him away. And mm -hmm. I think the, the Orioles are going to be there scooping them up. They have so many people that are yeah. majorly ready that they can trade for them. And I think that that's what those teams are going to be looking for is a major is major league ready players. And so I think that that matchup is so great. It'll be curious to see how those teams do. Because a good Blake Snell 
in his second half of the season. And if Grayson Rodriguez seems like he's starting to actually figure it out, his fastball is not getting hit nearly as much this year as it has in the past. So if you can kind of shore up that, you know, pitching rotation with a, with a guy, with an elite guy halfway through the season, knowing that, you know, you're going to lose him at the end of the season anyway, or he's not going to pitch that well and he's not going to opt out. And then you'll get him another year for not too bad of a price. It seems like a, a match made in heaven for me if it works out that way. The only thing is if I'm the Orioles, I have to be very careful there. I don't feel like giving up a lot of these top prospects for a rental. True. I, that's the only thing is that I would have to get some sort of assurance that they're sticking around an extra year. And then I get them for two playoff runs minimum. That way I would feel better. So are there guys that we haven't identified yet here in the first three and a half weeks or four weeks of the season that are going to be available? Yeah. You know, or I, I don't know. I, I just, that's why to me, the Orioles are so fascinating because they have yeah. so many different directions that they can go. All right, let's get to your team. The Pittsburgh Pirates, Paul Skeens at the AAA level in Indy, unhittable again on Thursday. Three and a third, which means he recorded 10 outs. Eight via the strikeout. 34 of his 43 four-seamers clocked in at least 100 miles an hour. We don't know when he's coming up. We hope it's very soon. Steven, you have seen him up close. When he gets to the major league level, are we talking about immediately that he becomes one of the five to eight best pitchers in the sport? Yes. And I, I, I say that confidently for, for a few reasons. One of them being he's a command pitcher. He really is. It is. It, I know it's funny to say that everybody sees 100. You assume that's what he is. He is a command pitcher who happens to throw consistently 100 miles an hour up to so far 102. Who knows where that's going to go? But he's got three pitches that he uses. He's got that four-seamer. He uses a two-seamer, too, but I don't really count that for right now. And then he's got his upper 80s slider thing that moves a ton that gets a crazy amount of swing and miss. And then this year he started throwing what he calls the splinker, which is a splitter-sinker combination. He's throwing 94, 95 miles an hour, and you just saw it in that video. It's dropping off a table. It looks like an actual true splitter, it's about five miles an hour off his fastball, but his fastball carries like nothing I've ever seen. If you watch, when you watch him play, there's guys who throw hard that the fastball doesn't look that hard. And there are guys who throw hard that the fastball looks like it's unhittable. He's the unhittable type. And there's, there's a huge gap between different 100 mile an hour fastballs. This guy has the elite, elite 100 mile an hour fastball. But he's a command pitcher, dude. He's only walked four people. He's given up five hits. And he's got, what, 27 strikeouts and 12 and two-thirds innings so far. I had the pleasure of playing with Tyler Glass now in AAA. And when Tyler Glass now was in AAA, he was clearly better than every other person that he was playing against. The difference was that the ball was all over the place. He was effectively wild. Guys were swinging at curveballs that were bouncing a foot in front of the home plate. You know, it was just like he was just so nasty. This is different. He's getting these swings and misses, making AAA players, ex-big leaguers, look like low-A players with the swings they're taking on pitches in the zone. That's amazing. He looks really good. He looks like very little effort. And, I mean, I can't wait to see what, what he ends up being up here. But also, you know, they're taking it very slow. So I, I don't know what that timeline looks like. But when it gets here, it's going to be something to see, man. It's, you know, it's Strasburg 15 punch outs in his major league debut type of exciting for me. Okay. If he had started the year in the big leagues and there hadn't been a restrictor played on him, let's just play this game. Could he have won the Cy Young? <sighs> that's a, that's a fun question. Very hypothetical in a lot of ways. Uh, yeah, I would, I would say he could have, I mean, I watched him pitch in spring training against major league hitters and it's the same thing. He just, he, he is not <laughs> like, it is not because he's facing triple A hitters that he is dominating. He will dominate against major league hitters against guys with good approaches who only swing at pitches in the zone, all that stuff, you know, hit mistakes. He doesn't make many mistakes and his mistakes are 101 miles an hour with run and ride like he's he's something different and he will show that when he gets up here i don't think there's going to be any kind of 
maturation process when he gets here. It's just about building him up because the pirates want him to be healthy for, for a long time. You know, if I personally believe that there's, there's a possibility we might be looking at, you know, the pirates eventually signing this guy to that mega deal that they've never done before, because that's the kind of pitcher that he is the way that, Witt Jr. got the Royals to step out of their comfort zone and give him that mega deal they had never done before. I can see that happening with the Pirates with Paul Skeens. I, I hope so. Me and too. last thing, I know that you're because you're employed by the Pirates, there's only so much you can say. Just nod your head if he's pitching in the major leagues after May 1st. You know just, just nod your head. Is that – Diagonal? I didn't ask you to be a bobblehead. <laughs> Dude, I, I honestly believe that he could. I, I, I don't know, though, because, like, you know, three innings every start, you know, they don't, it's not like they tell us what their, what their process is with these players anyway. I'm just an analyst. But if I'm analyzing from the outside, it seems like it's going to take a little bit longer than that. And it's just by choice of wanting to make sure that he does build up correctly in a professional schedule. That's it. Okay. All right. Last thing. Um, of course, Skeen's number one overall pick, Jack Leiter, a number two overall pick back in 2021. Major League debut Thursday in Detroit. Uh, pretty rickety. Gave up seven runs, didn't get out of the fourth. Now, his pop, Al Leiter, whom I know very well, was there. Nervous Al. Al's nervous about everything in life. He's always like this. He's like, it's like he's on 18 cups of coffee. So I could only imagine what was going through his veins yesterday as he was watching his boy out there, how proud he was and everything else. What do you remember most about your major league debut and with respect to your family? Dude, it was really cool. I had, I'm 17 people. I would, I do a main debut in St. Louis and I had 17 family and friends make their way out to St. Louis and watch me throw that debut uh, it was the coolest thing ever. I, I saw them the night before a little bit, and then they went and partied. And then the you know day of the game, they were having a good time all day. And I think trying to get rid of some nerves for them, you know. Um, but dude, I it was the best experience ever. Everybody always says that, but I got to start on the fifth of July in St. Louis. It was a million degrees, and there were forty eight thousand people there. And I always say this, whenever anybody asks my, my debut, I say the biggest thing I remember is when I walked out on that mound, two things. One, it, you know, that kind of effect they do in movies where like you see something and then it like zooms away and it looks really far away. Like that's what it felt like. It felt like the mound was, was 80 feet instead of 60 feet because like the depth of the stadium is so much different than any minor league stadium. But then it was so red dude, everybody's wearing red. All the seats are red. And I was just like, this is the coolest thing I have ever experienced in my life. No question. But first pitch I threw right down the middle to Matt Carpenter for strike one. And I, I mean, honestly, I could have, I could have pulled it and thrown it in our dugout and I wouldn't have been surprised because I could not feel my body. But like, as far as like the debut goes, I got out of the first inning because there's a runner on first and Matt Holiday hit a thousand mile an hour line drive right to my first baseman who caught it and stepped on first base for a double play. That's how I got out of the first inning. If that had gotten past him and now it's second and third one out, I'm probably like, I mean, <laughs> I'm probably unraveling and giving up 12 runs. You know what I mean? It's, it is a, it's a tough situation to be put in. This guy is going to be fine, dude. He's nasty. And everybody gives up runs every now and then it's going to, Paul schemes will give up runs. It will happen. Everybody does, but Hey, Good for you. I know he's, he's probably going to end up having a great season. We'll all look back on this and be like, remember when he made that debut and it was brutal? But yeah. I'm not worried. I've known that kid since he was like 10. I'm just mm -hmm. happy for him, and I'm happy for his, uh, his pops as well. So the start of a career in the Rose family, we're getting close to the end of a career. Our youngest son, Brady, had his senior day yesterday. Uh, we still have a couple more games left. But, man, like it, everybody knows I'm very emotional. Like it was a hard thing for me. Like to see him out there. Now, the cool thing was he came on in relief and he pitched the last four innings. He actually picked up the win, gave up one earned, pitched very well. Like he's kind of all over the place. He's a little bit of glass now, minus the yeah. big, big curveball in the hundred <laughs> miles an hour. He's a little bit all over. The, so he was he was really good. Thirty seven of his fifty two pitches were strikes. Ooh. Good control, didn't walk anybody, hit one guy, gave up one hit, I think. Really good job. But it was just awesome to see him and the other 
six seniors. It's a great class of dudes. Some of his best friends are around. So Tori, Micah, Stoops, Sam, there's Brady next to him, 22, Andrew, Max, whom I coached when he was seven years old. Like, it's awesome to see these guys now graduate from a great high school and move on to some amazing colleges. But it's going to be a tough time in the Rose household whenever they're going to the playoffs. So hopefully we, it ends with a championship, but you just never know. Hey, you, you always hope to end on a positive note. But, like, I, I mean, I remember my end of high school baseball and – it's it's tough you know it's like you you really feel like you represent the school and you love wearing that uniform and then all of a sudden it's over and you look back and you're like man i thought i was just a freshman like five minutes ago you know what i mean and and that keeps happening as you get older you know you know that obviously things keep speeding up but man i loved my high school experience i'm so glad for him i, I love that he had a good time uh and a hey a good a good outing maybe go win a chip to walk it off dude that'd yeah. be sick and the thing he's been doing this year that's really cool is he does he designed not only our uniforms when he was a freshman he's really into graphic design he does all of our all of our work on our instagram uh he's got his own page as well and he designed the senior t-shirts where it's pretty cool check it out if you want to on our uh Brentwood bsb that's that's what it is bsb yeah so go check it out he does all the artwork i will kind of cool uh, awesome catching up with you, dude. Continued success. You have my wife, Michelle Rose, to thank for your appearance today. Because I was like, man, uh, I asked Jolly, Jolly Olive, of course, but he's a little busy at the warehouse today. And uh, and she's like, what about Brault? He's always so good. I was, like, I was like, oh, my God, I forgot about little Stevie. It makes my heart happy. I'm glad. I'm glad to be thought of and considered. It's really fun to do this. I always love, you know, you know me, man. This is what we do. Even when we text, do we ever text about anything other than baseball? I mean, this is just, this is what we do, man. I love it. This is it. This is it. I think she just wanted somebody at least Trevor Plouffe's equal in terms of looks. Oh, okay. Hey, I'll, I'll take equal. Yeah, yeah, I'll take equal. Different, different, but same, same. God, I wonder how that vote would go. Who's hotter, <laughs> Brault or Plouffe? We might have to put that out on John Boy Media. That Ugh. one, ooh, that could be the that could be the highest vote total of all time in the history of the company. Wow, I'm uh, I'm so I'm so so truly ashamed to be on this podcast right now. I'm just kidding. It is so much fun, and I appreciate you, man. It's awesome. It's awesome. Best to you and the entire family. Uh, Plouffe will be back on Monday. So for our one of a kind producer, Dan Rourke. And the always entertaining Stephen Brault. I'll throw that out there. I am Chris Rose. We will see you Monday on Baseball Today.